Small business management. All right. So, yep, we're good. Um, Mike, fire away. Yeah. Okay. Um, give you a little background. I'm going to give you a little background story of how I got where I am right now. And then whatever questions that doesn't cover, then we'll pick up and do some question and answer and stuff like that. Um, in September of 1965, I started junior college in Phoenix, Arizona, and one of the classes I took was business, Introduction to Business 101, which seems to be a mandatory class for everybody to suffer through. At that point, I was 19 years old. <coughs> I had had my first business at 13 doing lawn and yard maintenance and um, had been working for a few gas stations through high school. The summer, um, uh, I took a year off uh, between high school and junior college and did an internship with the business office. Mike, you might in my just yeah. one second. Bakersfield, can you see Mike okay now? Yes. yes. Okay, just want to make sure. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Anyway, and I uh, <coughs> uh, was working for uh, Jack in the Box. You know, I, I did Jack in the Box instead of McDonald's. I thought I'd go a different path. But um, the <coughs> so when I got into the business introduction class, I mean, after the first lesson, I was thinking, okay, this guy doesn't have a clue about what the real world's like when you're working, and. Um, and like they said in the last conversation, this is a business here. You're paying to learn how to do business and stuff. So it's it's real important that you get feedback and um, that you actually learn something, that you get something out of it. <coughs> what I found with education, when you go to school, and by the way, another, I'll, I'll tell you a lot of little anecdotal things. Um, I went to Phoenix College for on and off part-time, full-time for between five and a half and six years, and a good friend and customer of mine, we were having dinner with last year, and I mentioned that because <coughs> we were in Phoenix, and uh, he said, Mike, junior college is supposed to be two years, and but, you know, like a lot of us, I was working, supporting myself, doing all that, and um, the advantage I had by going to school so much is I basically took four years of classes, and um, how many of you guys have taken accounting? Everybody's had accounting, great. Because if you don't know how to do the books and you don't know the difference between assets and liabilities and P&L, cash flow, balance sheet and all that, you're, um, <coughs> you're, you're really gonna have a struggle with um, whatever aspect of business you're involved in. The, um, um, because surprisingly enough, most of the jobs in America are with small business. And I have a, a lot of different sayings I've come up with. Um, one of them is the, there's only, when it comes to paychecks, there's only two kinds of people in the world. Those that sign at the back of a paycheck and those that sign the front of the paycheck. How many of you have signed the front of a paycheck? Show of hands. Besides my one, yeah, okay. So a couple of you signed the front of a paycheck. So you know what's involved with having the money to cover the paycheck and doing business in California is tremendously um, tough. Um, being my own boss and having my own business, I have the advantage I can wear um, tennis shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt to work in the morning and it doesn't bother the, the work that I do. But um, you're all familiar with Cabela's. They make sporting goods and all that stuff. They used to make five pocket shorts. Because of California, they now make seven pocket shorts. Because we have so many bureaucracies that get their hand in our pocket to take money out. <laughs> and none of them put money in. That's the one thing you'll learn. Um, they don't want to put money in your pocket. Um, and for some reason, a lot of the government agencies have this attitude. We are in business. If we increase your cost, you just raise your price and pass it on to the consumer. Well, in a closed environment of California, that'll work great. But for most of us, we're working in a, a national or international environment, and it creates real competitive hardships on us. Um, so, <coughs> but anyway, I survived junior college, um, moved to California in 72, worked for an, 
another fast food chain for a while. Um, and then I got into aviation full time, working on airplanes at Van Nuys Airport. And then I was able to um, start working just on engines. And so basically since, um, I would say 74, I've only worked on airplane engines. And I was able to get into a um, market that was just starting Good. Okay, that was just really taking off on the World War II airplane restorations, and um, the I worked for another shop for a while in the valley, and then in the summer of '78 we started our own business at Chino Airport. Excuse me. We were, Mike, hang on one second. Bakersfield, are you guys okay there? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're we're increasing the volume. We can't hear from. Yeah, I was, I was concerned that you might not be able to hear Mike very well. I'm trying to move the mic as close the mic as close to Mike as I can. Oh, okay. I can slide over with it. That's uh, not a problem. Yeah, if, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. If you want to, like, yeah. sit here. That's kind of You can still see You've got right? the, the projector oh, yeah. in front of you, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll move the camera yeah. so oh, you're centered again. Um, how's that? Everybody here all right? That's better. Okay. Um, summer of 78, we started our own business, um, and um, classic American opportunity for the small entrepreneur. I had my toolbox and $3,000 saved up. That was our starting capital. And um, we rented a shop space at Chino Airport in the morning, got some stationery printed up, ordered a phone line, got... Um, put up a mailbox on the row of mailboxes in front of the airport, and by the end of the day, we were a business. Um, and it's amazing how easy it is to go into business in the United States. There's no other country in the world that gives us that opportunity with so little struggle and a few business licenses, things like that, depending on what you do, but um, it's really amazing how simple it is to go into business. Um, the one thing I regret is in those days we didn't have a book called the E-Myth, which um, hopefully you've all heard about or read at some point. Um, the E-Myth, the e, uh, when it first came out I thought it was e-commerce and I didn't pay much attention to it. But the E is the entrepreneurial spirit and it's that little flash in time where you say, wow, I could provide this service or this product and have my own business. And then you... Um, step off the cliff, and on the way down, you re realize that there's a lot more to it than what you thought. Um, the one thing I like about the E Myth um, is the whole focus of the book is getting people to understand that you'll either you're going to be really good at either providing the product and service of the business, or you're going to be really good at managing it. Very few people are really good at being able to wear all those hats, and so if you're involved in business, you really want to know yourself, you really want to know your skill set. You want to have a couple people that you meet with regularly, weekly, bi-weekly, that you can get feedback, and, excuse me, kind of like mentors that um, basically can listen to you and you can listen to them brainstorm and talk about what you're dealing with and um, get that ongoing feedback because the challenge in business, especially when you're in a leadership or management role, is you rarely get feedback. It's like you said, you know, you get feedback at the end of the year and you said you had your comments that you shared and all that. If you're not getting regular feedback, um, it's really easy to go off on a tangent that um, you're not going to survive from. So, but um, fortunately I had the experience of providing the product, which was restoring old airplane engines. And I had the business background from having grown up around business and stuff. The business, um, my dad was a stockbroker, did mergers, um, venture capital, all back in the 40s and 50s, 60s in L.A. So um, I didn't grow up on Wall Street, but I was well aware. Of, in L.A. it was Spring Street, where all the brokerage firms were. And I knew what a, um annual report was and stocks, bonds. Had a really good understanding of that before I ever got out of high school and stuff. So, but um, again, um, back to my history. The we started the business and um, we 
we had to do a lot of self-financing. We, we borrowed on our cars, our house, everything we had at times to expand the business. And um, <coughs> we now have three corporations. Uh, it's a sole, pr sole proprietorship for really exotic air flying engines. And we have an industrial park, commercial property, roofing and stuff. So my wife and I are multi-millionaires. Um, my grandson asked me on the phone today if I'd ever had a million dollars at one time. And I said, three quarters at one time mm -hmm. in a check. But you know the thing about money and all that stuff, it's really easy to lose touch with it. And when you're in business, you think the money coming in is your money, but it's not. You only get what's left over at the end of the day on a profit and loss. Um, but your job is to manage it and make the best you can of it. So, um, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes. We've lost a lot of money over the years, we've, but we've been able to build the business up. And um, we have um, 34 people working for us right now. And we bring over three million a year into the Tehachapi economy. So we're real popular with the local government because we don't take anything out of the economy. We don't recycle it. It's all clean, fresh money that comes into the local economy. So the ripple effect of our business and economy is huge. Um, but it, it's that way with most businesses. You're either bringing money into the local economy from the outside, outside of the community, or you're recycling money that's in the community. You know, fast food, grocery stores, things like that, um, gas stations, they all recycle their local economy and stuff. But businesses that are bringing, you know, outside money, it's um, a big benefit for the local economies and stuff. But um, small business is, uh, are we classing them at 25 employees or less? Uh, um, is that what I, you mean? It's so, honestly, we were just talking about that last week, and you know, Tom, for example, is in, uh, he's a contracting specialist at Edwards right now, and he was saying that in some cases, in, in the contracts he does, a, a thousand 1,200 per, 1200 person company is considered small because if you compare that to a 100,000 person company, it is small. But mm -hmm. um, yes, 25 is definitely small. I think the SBA usually says 500 employees or less, but 500 to me is not a small business anymore. No, that's a pretty big county chart. does 100. Yeah, okay. So it's, you know, it's perspective. But bottom line, it's, it's you people as individuals that are going to be involved in business and ownership, management. I think is what everybody's geared towards. So, um, the you know I've learned a lot over the years in managing and stuff like that. The one thing I did learn that I preach everywhere I go is you never stop learning. You're always looking for the latest business book, the latest uh, paper um, information, um, because our business is we have the luxury that. <coughs> We don't get um, we don't get a lot of competition. We don't get a lot of change in what our, what our product product is. Everything we work on was basically built in World War II, and we're just keeping it flying. Is basically what we're doing. Um, most business though have a lot of competition. Technology is constantly evolving. Um, we we were the first business. Um, in our field, and when we were back in the, well, it would have been the late 70s, we were the first one to get an Apple II computer. Uh, we were the first one to get a fax machine. Does everybody know what a fax machine, when they first came out, it was that thermal paper that came off a roll, mm -hmm. and you could, you, could, you could read it faster than it could come out of the machine when it first mm -hmm. came out, and you had to be real careful with that thermal paper, because if you let it sit in the sunlight, it would turn the same color as the printing and then you couldn't read it. And um, um, I remember when we got our first bag phone, and then we got the shoe phone, and there was the flip phone. Is there anybody in here that doesn't have a cell phone, iPhone, Galaxy, whatever? I don't think so. I mean, the state of communication is phenomenal. I mean, I've got a three or four year old iPhone, and yet, I mean, we've got email, fax, I mean, not faxes, but text messaging. Um, just the, the ability to communicate all over the world is just phenomenal now. Get information. Uh, my, one of my granddaughters calls her dad's uh, 
Samsung or whatever it is, I don't know, it's one of the bigger screens. She calls it the answer machine. Well, mm -hmm. Dad, ask the answer machine. So, I mean, you know, the world is changing so fast and you have to be plugged into the changes, the technology, what's going on, what your competitors are doing. In fact, I tell restaurant owners, I said, every week you have to have one meal at your competitors in your area. Find out what they're doing, how they're serving it, and are they doing it better than you are or not, and learn from that experience. And it's the same thing in every business. You've got to pay attention to competition because, believe me, their number one goal besides making a profit is to eat you alive. And um, so you can't turn your back on growth and technology. I remember um, being in Florida in, oh, probably 85 with one of our customers. Because one of the things I've done over the years is I do field service. And um, unlike the Maytag repairmen, we're really busy. And um, I've got well over two million air miles traveling around the world working on airplanes and customers and stuff. And I was with a guy in Florida and um, he was in north of uh, Fort Lauderdale and he specialized in high-end sport fishing boat equipment modifications, equipment like that, making a ton of money and all that stuff. And he had a question I was going to have something sent from the shop office. And I said, well, where's your, where's your, what's your fax number? Oh, that's absurd. Why would anybody have a fax machine, you know? And six months later, he had one every, he even had one in his bedroom so he could stay connected because he realized just how important they were in the communications and stuff. So um, it's real easy to say, oh, I don't need that or what good is it and stuff. But um, decisions like that, you don't want to make on your own. I mean, you want input. You want feedback from the people you work with and stuff like that. You want feedback from um, just the real world. It's so easy as management, especially upper management, to start, um, we call it the omnipotent syndrome, where you think you got all the answers, especially when you start doing something a little different. Well, I'm successful in this. Obviously, that's going to roll over into that, and I'll be a superstar with that. And um, it's a real quick way to disaster is when you start thinking you have all the answers. And um, having people that you meet with on a regular basis. I've got two guys I meet every Thursday morning for breakfast. And every once in a while, one of my buddies will say, Mike, why don't you get your head out of the dark area and join the party? Because I've said something really stupid or said, I think I'm going to do this. And um, You know, if you don't have that feedback, you're going to set yourself up for a crash and burn, and um, I have written on the wall in my first office corporation that was started, I've got a card and it says, a business can only survive as long as it can afford its mistakes. Because believe me, you will make mistakes, and the sooner you course correct, figure out what you did wrong, the less expensive it can be. So, so there's, a, there's a lot to it, um, but again, Never stop learning and never stop getting feedback from both your customers and your competition indirectly by observing what they do. And of course, the people you work with is who you're going to get feedback from. So, um, some of the questions were um, uh, one of the really observant questions was Is my business, um, I think they use the term twilight or whatever, or whatever. It, am I going into a, a phase where eventually there won't be any customers because of the age of the airplanes and stuff like that? At times I thought that, but watching the growth of the business and, uh, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold here. For a long time, I wondered how long the um, <coughs> the business was going to be viable. But, um, you know, when you look around at how many people collect old cars and things like that, um, <coughs> there are still people collecting 
and restoring World War I airplanes from 1918, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> what's happened to World War II airplanes have, there's basically three levels of them. <clears throat> there's the trainers, which are the low end price wise, <coughs> and collectible wise airplanes. There's the um, run of the mill fighters, of which there's quite a bit, and bombers, things like that. And then there's the real exotic ones where there's only one or two of them that are still existing and stuff in the high end. Um, <clears throat> you can buy a typical trainer for a couple hundred thousand. A P-51 Mustang is close to two million. If it's a trainer with two controls, it's three million. Um, a German fighter, some of the airplanes we're working on now are in the seven to eight million dollar bracket. Um, so we're talking about really high-end people, and um, <clears throat> I don't do a lot of name dropping, but some of our customers, we've worked for a number of astronauts that have gone to be very successful in business, Frank Borman, Bill Anders, um, we're actually two of the astronauts that first went around the moon, sent back that picture mm -hmm. of the Earth rising over the moonscape, Bill Anders took that picture, they've been customers. They're amazing people to work for. Um, <coughs> like what, do you want some more soda? I can go ahead. No, it's just water. You got enough? Yeah, it's okay. just water. I'm fine. Um, the, um, we like working for college dropouts that have made money. One of our customers is a partner, one of the two founders of uh, Microsoft. It's a big collector of airplanes. Um, but I also work for very successful business people professional lawyers, doctors, things like that. So we have a fairly wide spectrum of people. And while from a name dropping standpoint, well, that's cool, I get to know them, a few people. Um, yeah, um, when it comes to name dropping, we can have a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, I've worked for Tom Cruise, he has a P-51 he plays with. Um, but you know, these, these are all people. I mean, what you see in the public and the movies and all the other stuff, it's just image. <clears throat> you know, when you see these people when they're around their toys, which they like to play with, Jay Leno's the same way. I mean, they're just little kids. They're just like the rest of us. They just have more expensive toys and a faster lifestyle. But you know, for the most part, they're real. I mean, they're real people. They're not the flash in the pan, you know, the media frenzy stars that are here today, gone tomorrow. They're, they're successful because they paid their dues. You know, there's a... Uh, one of the books that I've read was The Outliers, I think it is. And, mm -hmm. you, know, and, you know, in there he, he documents the fact that most successful groups, people, whatever, they've invested over 10,000 man hours in getting to be skilled at what they do. You know, it doesn't come overnight. It seems to come overnight because of the media and all the other stuff. But the reality is successful people have invested a lot of time and effort to be where they are. And they paid their dues and they kept their head down and they you know, they sucked it up when they didn't like what was going on. They've sat through boring classes, they've, uh, you know, worked extra hours. You know, they've done what it takes to be, to be successful, whatever field they get. For us, being able to talk to these people around the world, and in fact, one of our customers is uh, a board member on the Deutsche Bank in Germany, Berlin. Um, it's just, it's amazing the people we've get we've gotten to know and work for, um, and yeah, we're we're an exception to the rule of life and business. But for the most part, a successful business takes care of its customers, its clients, its customers, and it's constantly trying to figure out what we can do better, how we can do this better. And again, going back to the feedback, boy, if you're not getting feedback from your customer, boy, you're in trouble because, you know, the old saying, if you're happy, tell at least 10 people. If you're unhappy, tell me immediately. You know, it's an old cliche, but it's incredibly important for business. And when a customer complains or has a gripe or something, you've got to realize that's probably the tip of the iceberg. Because somebody that will take the time to say something is this part of the tip of the iceberg. The, the people that will actually write something to you, send you an email or a letter or something like that, um, that's a lot more effort. And when somebody goes to that much effort, 
they've really probably got something to say that we really want to focus on that and follow up on it and see if it's a misunderstanding or if it's something you did wrong, but you really don't want to ignore that stuff. Um, you know, the Titanic tried to ignore an iceberg, didn't work. Um, didn't look that big at first, and then all of a sudden, whoops, um, and we know how that ended. Um, and that's what happens with small business. One of the statistics that you'll find if you do the E-Myth book, and then the later textbook that the guys put out, which is incredibly educational, um, for every 100 businesses that open up in 2016, five years later, 80% of them will be gone. Five more years, 80% of those 20 businesses will be gone. So you're down to, after 10 years, you're down to four or five businesses out of 100. And there's a reason for that, and it's because they aren't, um, they don't get what it is to run a business. They start off with an idea, a dream, a vision, and they don't, um, they don't learn to bring people around them that balance their skill set. Again, what the, one of the main things he says in his book is, you're either gonna be really good at producing or managing. And um, wherever you're weak, you've gotta get somebody to support you in that. So if, you're, if your product, if you're good at putting out your product or the service that you're doing, you've gotta have somebody to manage the business. And then he goes on to say that, um, and this is all stuff that I've learned the hard way, um, bookkeeping, tax records, staying up to on top of what's going on. I mean, the number one reason that businesses go out of, that fail in America is because you get behind on the taxes. When you're writing paychecks and you're juggling the bills and all that stuff, it's the easiest one to skimp on. I guarantee I've done that. The IRS and I are like that. We communicate regularly. And um, it's, um, again, you need people that balance you and equal you in the skill set that you bring to the business and it, that team approach and, um, and legal. I mean, you've got to have somebody that keeps an eye on the legality of what you're doing and all the other stuff. Um, and one other really good advice, a couple of really good advice that I got over the years from very successful business people, which is why I'm where I am today, is because I listen to smart people. And Tony Robbins says that over and over. You want to be successful, go listen and emulate smart, successful people. He says, don't reinvent the wheel. You'll find there's better ways to do it. I mean, finesse the wheel, but don't reinvent the wheel. And um, uh, one, one early customer came in and watched what we were doing at the shop and the detail we were putting into the engines and all that stuff. And he asked me why I didn't let some of the employees do some of the work. And I said, well, because I know how to do it the best in the right way, and that's what customers want. And he said, as soon as you learn how to leverage that skill and teach that to your employees to where they can do it to your level, he said, your business will explode. And so don't try to be irreplaceable. Don't. I realized I was a choke point. I had uh, production was, uh, was, wasn't what it could be with the people I had because there were three, four things that only I did and stuff like that. And um, so leverage your talents. Teach your people how to do everything you can. Let them be even better. In fact, I would say for most of the people that work for me, they do any specific job they do better than I would do because I'll be distracted. I've got, you know, I just, they do it every day. I would do it once a week, once a month type thing. So. It's real important that um, you leverage your abilities and your skills with your people. Empower them to be able to do everything you can do and do it better. And that will make a huge difference on how successful you are in business. Um, can I segue off that with a question? Yeah. Um, I think I, there's, a, there's, a whole, I, there's all kinds of questions I want to get, but I think a good segue right now. Um, and now that you described that your dad was a stockbroker, mm -hmm. I'm even more curious. How did you get into restoring airplane engines? Like, it doesn't sound like that was naturally in your path necessarily um, when you in younger in life. Like, when I was a kid, I had electric trains, I had mechanical sets, I had a chemistry set, but they took that away mm -hmm. um, after the fire department left. Um, 
But I grew up in the 50s when all this stuff, scouting, all this stuff was there for kids, boys and girls, where you could learn some incredible skills, hands-on stuff, you know, in your garage, in your basement, your bedroom, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I was blessed in that I was born in 1945. My dad was a prolific Catholic. He had one wife in the World War I area where he grew He had seven kids coming out of World War I in the 30s, remarried in the early 40s to my mom, had four more kids. So I had five brothers and sisters that I grew up around, half of which were um, old enough to be my parent. And they were all having kids my age. And so my sisters and brother and I, we had all these nephews and cousins, and their parents were all involved in World War II. And World War II was an incredible moment in time. I don't know if you know your history, but at the end of World War II, in 1946, the United States was the power in the world. We had, we were basically, other than a few rounds that were fired into the hills above Santa Barbara by the Standard Oil deal from a Japanese submarine, the United, continental United States was untouched by the war. We had the largest and strongest infrastructure for manufacturing. We had half of the wealth and manufacturing capability of the world was the 48 states of the United States. And all these people were coming back from the war and they went to work and we developed the most incredible consumer economy that's ever been seen in the world in the 50s and stuff. And so I grew up in the fringe of that. And my oldest brothers um, set up a company down in Van Nuys at the airport, uh, rebuilding airplanes and stuff like that. So I had my dad doing business world. I had brothers that were involved in aviation. Um, Frank was an engineer at Lockheed during the war. Robert was in the Coast Guard. They started the business in Van Nuys. My oldest sister's husband was an engineer at North American. He worked all the way through the B-70 before he retired. And um, another brother-in-law worked for Douglas. So I had a huge influence in aviation and stuff growing up. So, I mean, as Warren Buffett loves to say, and he's a great guy to read up on and listen to, he said, a lot, anybody that's born in the United States has won the basic lottery as far as, you know, he calls it the ovary lottery or the womb lottery or whatever. I mean, being born in the United States or living in the United States is a huge step up over any other country in the world. And he said if he'd have been born in any other country in the world, he'd probably still be there and all that stuff. But he, he was born in a good place at the right time and took advantage of it. So we have incredible opportunities, and that's why I'm where I am. Um, I have a real good head for business because of my family background, and I've got a really good head for mechanical aviation because of what I grew up with and where I'm back. So, again, I'm very fortunate to have the background I have and stuff. And that's a whole couple hours right there of family history just with aviation, but we won't go there. Uh, Mike, I, you got a chance to go to the bathroom right before you came in. Mm -hmm. I, Do you guys need a break? I, I think they've been able to step out a little bit. I have not. Okay. Um, and I think Tom had a great question that I want him to articulate next. I think that will okay. probably take us until I get back. So I'm going to step out just for a second. Okay, before he starts, uh -huh. I want to finish this one thread that I was on. Go ahead. Um, you know, with having all the advisors and empowering your employees, um, the absolute number one thing you have to empower your employees is to call a timeout. They have to be able to say, whoa, whoa, timeout. Can we take another look at this? It's a polite way of them telling you, you know, you might have your head in the wrong place. You might have actually been wrong. I had a former boss that he had a cute saying. He said that um, I, I I was wrong once. I thought I'd made a mistake, but I didn't. So, you know, work with it. And, you know, that ego in business is a short path to um, failure. So, Tom? Yes. I'll be right back. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. So, um, I work as a contract specialist uh, for Edwards Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the time we buy sole source parts or sole source equipment or even sole source services, uh, where it's very hard to uh, make sure that you're getting a competitive price. Mm -hmm. I would imagine in what you do with uh, airplanes that haven't been manufactured for 70 years, that trying to get all the parts you need uh, can sometimes be pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. How do you 
how do you make sure that um, that you're not paying too much for something that you can only get from one spot, um, or how do you work that into into your business as far as uh, being able to to make sure you're providing a although a, a portable product for a seven million dollar plane is probably a, a little bit different than, than a regular business, but how, how do you deal with that? Um, most of the stuff that we've accumulated and stuff was all surplused out after the war for different reasons and stuff. Um, when we're doing the real exotic, rare stuff like the German engines, stuff like that, um, typically it'll take two or three engines to get enough parts to make stuff. Um, uh, Warren Buffett loves the term, you gotta love a monopoly. Um, when you're dealing with a monopoly uh, where only one person has the part, really work on the relationship and you communicate the, the effect of their pricing on your business which affects their business because um, if they're the sole supplier they probably have fairly limited markets they're working with too and um, you basically have to tell them that you don't you can price yourself out of business even though you don't game in town um, because there's not a whole lot that they anybody has that isn't reproducible. It's just a matter of time and money to make the parts. So when you're dealing with a sole proprietor, and we run into that all the time because um, there's different parts for the engines that only certain people have. And the advantage that we've got now is the bulk of our product, uh, the engines we do, we have the largest inventory in the world, so we are the sole supplier, and we don't supply to the competition because we're ruthless about it. Why would we want to empower our, our competitor to compete with us? So basically, if they've got something we can use and we've got something they want, we'll trade, but we won't just sell stuff outright anymore. That was, uh, but again, sole suppliers, you've got to work on the relationship, the communication, and just say that, um, you don't have competition, I do. If you want me to be your vendor, you know, your one of your customers, I have to match the needs of my customers. We have to find a balance here. And with the airplane engines, our job is to find a balance between safety and operation and economic feasibility to where they can afford to operate the airplane. Because if the price point goes up too high, we all know what happens. The customers go next door or they do it thou or whatever, or they start their own company to compete with you. Now, have you, have you faced uh, many of those uh, uh, buy or make decisions where you know, that, the guy just wants too much for whatever he's offering, but I think I can get it machined or made or, or, or something? Yeah, we do that on a regular basis. Um, fortunately, we can get all the blueprints, drawings for all the parts that America and British made during the war. Um, the challenge on the parts is the German engines, stuff like that, Russian stuff, where we have to reverse engineer it. Um, fortunately, engineering, physics, math, science is the same, no matter whether you speak English, German, or Japanese. Um, so we've got that advantage. I had to learn how to translate German documents to understand how the German engines work and stuff. But um, one of the nice things that came out of World War II was um, all the allies standardized all the metallurgy and metals and stuff, and I was able to get an original copy of the Army-Navy mill spec for every metal we used in World War II, except for two. Plutonium and uranium were left out. <laughs> I don't know why, but everything else is in there. How to manufacture the metal, how to operate with it, how to heat treat it. So it's probably an inch and a half thick. And um, so the amount of information I can get for, you know, developing stuff is great. And we can take all those original specs and give it to the manufacturers. And, and we have a lot of stuff made. We really do. There, there's a lot of stuff that we call consumables, gaskets, seals, things like that. They've been gone forever. We've been making those for years. Did you have a question? Yeah, so a lot of the advancement in as far as industrial you know, manufacturing with like 3D CNC mills and mm -hmm. you know stuff like that, that's helped you, I'm sure, considerably, right? With it really helps when we have to have product parts made. Um, again, there's a price point. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff we have made on manual lays and mills where we actually, you know, we actually even do some of the work ourselves. 
other stuff where it's done on a computerized CNC machining process, um, they all have price points on where they'll take a minimum order and stuff like that. Um, one of the nice advantages of the industrial parts we've developed is we have a modern machine, is the name of the company. He has a CNC mill, lathe, wire cutters, and all that stuff. And he loves taking on the odd jobs that we throw him and stuff like that. And he doesn't have a real minimum. Um, when we moved into Tehachapi, a guy down the street, one of the early businesses in the industrial area was uh, Ward Automatic Machine Products. Basically, anything you can turn out on a lathe is what he would, you know, a threaded stud, a bushing, or anything like that. I mean, you know, he had seven or eight machines that would just go on 40, 50 hours a week. And it, guys, all they do is load them and programmers and the whole bit. The problem was his minimum order was 100,000 pieces. So, you know, we never really developed much of a relationship with that. <laughs> but you talk about being under pressure. I mean, what he was, the contracts he was negotiating. Okay, you're talking 100,000 parts. He said sometimes a quarter of a cent was the difference between getting a contract or not. So, I mean, you talk about um, sweating out the numbers and the costs and your hours and pushing your employees to optimize their output and stuff. I mean, he was a slave to his business. And everything you could in that tell. business, the huh? trading price of steel, oh. everything changes, you know, yeah. it changes the dynamic. I mean, you could lose money one day based on the contract you signed yesterday just because steel went up by 20 cents a pound or whatever. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Yep. So, but you want to read another question? Uh, yeah, if I, I can, if I can, you pick the if I can segue, actually, yeah. there's several questions that I think are all kind of wrapped, like they're all about the same topic. So, Serena had asked, um, how do you estimate the cost of the project? And and there's other people that are also asked, so what you know, sort of what's the average cost? And mm -hmm. I know Tom was uh, was we were talking before you got here about the fact that. You know, if, if there's a certain part that is very expensive for you to get to mm -hmm. and you quoted the wrong price, then you're going to end up, like, eating that on margin. So right. I think a lot of questions in here were about how do you estimate the price of a, the cost of a project so that you don't end up losing money. Yeah. Um, another question was how many, we've re how many uh, restorations we've done. Mm -hmm. um, we have done... Close to 500 engines over the last 30 some years. Uh, our current production is uh, between 18 and 20 a year now with the expansions that we've got. And basically, we have two groups. We have two product lines. We have the basically the American stuff that we've been doing for years, where we have a huge, uh, our biggest volume. Um, the American engines. We probably do close to three million a year on um, the exotic stuff, which is like the German or Russian, stuff like that. Uh, we can only handle about, um, with the labor force I have, we do close to a million a year on those. The, the bread and butter stuff, which we do all the time, and that's where we have a huge inventory of parts and stuff like that. We, we do so many of them that we know are in and out cost, and we have, we, we bid it, based on the normal wear parts and the expected labor and all that stuff. Typically those run about 100,000. Um, if they have a good uh, core engine, what they send into us. And so we kind of know what we do. But you know, in business you get a lot of these really cool savings and models. I've got one that you really want to memorize. It's in every deal, the big, big print will give it, the little print will take it away, the net is your margin and your profit. And don't screw it up. Um, and but to cover that and the fact that when we get an engine and it's an unknown until we really get it apart so if there's um, really expect you know if something internal that shouldn't be broken is broken then it goes back to the customer and they have to cover the extra cost so but if we have a bad day and have to do something over of course we do that over we test run every engine for three or four hours before we ship it on our own facilities and we do 98% of our warranty work on the test stand because when it leaves, we want it right, and stuff like that. So when we do the exotic engines, it's time and materials, and these projects can take two years or more, and 
Uh, one of the engines I'm doing right now is budgeted for two years at 5,000 man hours. And um, yeah, it's a big project. My wife had a question. I was just gonna say, you have the teardown inspection process that you do, and yeah. there's a flat fee for that, so you know what the yeah. quality of the, you might wanna talk about Yeah, that. that's the get out of jail card for the customer. We have a deposit we get, and then we do the complete teardown inspection of the engine. And then at that point, we tell them whether or not we can make the bid or the quote or the estimate. And at that point, they can pull it out and go somewhere else or not. Um, and the customer really likes that because basically we don't know until we get it apart. And a lot of times you'll have hidden damage. A lot of times there'll be stuff going away. Um, I don't want to offend anybody that's from Egyptian, is it from Egypt, but we have a saying called Egyptian syndrome. It's called living by denial. And, you know, people, you know, with, it doesn't matter with airplanes. I mean, we do it all the time. We're driving our cars or motorcycles or whatever. You know, oh, I should check that one tire or do this or whatever, or put gas in it. But I'll be okay. I can get to the next one. Or That's a new sound, but it doesn't sound that bad, you know. And um, my wife and I are involved with a lot of ministry stuff with the Christian church in our community. And I like taking youth pastors under my wing when they first come into the community. And um, I say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to drive down to my shop at least once a month to say hi or whatever. Turn the radio off, open the windows, and listen to the sounds your car's making. Because you talk about people who live in denial. Anybody that's on a budget, I mean, you do. I mean, you just try to ignore stuff. Um, we've all been there. And then we get hit with that big repair that, oh, man. I didn't see that coming. Well, you did, but you didn't. So, and and that's probably a huge issue for business people. Is the the difference between random data points and a trend is whether you're looking backwards or just coasting along going forward. It's you know when you look back at all the data that you've been accumulating, business sales, returns, complaints, things like that. If you look at that as random data. You're, it's going to kill you. If you look at it for trends and patterns, you're going to be, man, it's like having a, you know, uh, it's an incredible amount of information that you can work with. And most businesses that fail are denying the data. They just don't want to, they don't want to deal with the fact that things aren't going 100% perfect and they're going to get that big bonus at the end of the year and all the other stuff. And um, again, that's just living by denial. So it will hurt. So go ahead, Mike. Um, I I I I'm starting to guess the answer to this question, but I'd like to like see if I'm right or not. Like the two of the students had asked, it, Julia here, and then Tawana in uh, in Bakersfield as well had asked, uh, "Do you work with the government?" And it sounds like there's really like once once they were done with the planes in World War II, they don't really need them anymore or want them anymore. So all of your clients are private. Is that correct? Most of them are private. Um, Edwards Air Force Base is still operating older airplanes, and we work with uh, some of their contractors to keep their stuff going. In the back? Yeah, have you done any existing like museums or anything like that? Yeah, we work with a lot of museums. Um, there's basically two types of museums when it comes to airplanes. Mm -hmm. There's the display museums and the operating museums. Uh, Palm Springs has an operating museum. Um, where they actually fly the airplanes on a regular basis. Our buddy from Microsoft has a great museum up in the Seattle area. Um, huge collection of World War II airplanes, and they have every uh, every month they have a fly day during the five or six months of warm weather, where they'll have a theme where they'll fly different airplanes and stuff like that um, and stuff. We don't do much for the static museums where they're just gonna have stuff on display. If they're gonna do that, they basically just paint stuff and make it look good and that's it. But we only work for people that want to fly. So, so. Um, I think, I'm trying to decide what question I want. Well, first of all, it's 10.57. You said you had an hour, are you okay? Yeah. Still? Um, so yeah, we're good for another twenty or thirty. Okay, cool. Want, so, yeah. who's your competition? I think uh, um, Melissa had uh, had asked both. How did you get into this business in the first place? But also, who are your competitors? 
Uh, when we opened our shop in the summer of 78, um, there was at least eight or there was eight or ten of us in the business at that point. Um, now there's only two other viable shops that do this in the country. We've just outlasted them. Um, we've, you know, again, I said we've, you know, we've borrowed everything we could on our home or even cars and stuff to buy inventory and stuff. And over the years, we've bought out most of our competitors as they've uh, retired or uh, a few of them have died, things like that. But we've been able to buy their inventories and their parts and stuff like that. Um, and you know, and that's a, and that leads into another good question because early on I, I said you know different successful people giving a lot of advice. One of them said you know learn to leverage yourself, empower your employees, and all that. Um, the other one who was it was it was a question none of you probably ever heard, but when you're setting up a business, you have a business plan, and it, and he said the last page of your business plan has to be your exit strategy. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get out? What do you? Go ahead. Uh, to, to wanna, did, uh, Mike was halfway through uh, what he was oh, saying. I'm sorry, I, I thought that I, I will wait until after. That's fine. Go ahead. We'll we'll, 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 we'll I'll let him finish, but I, I will get back to you. Thank you for for like reminding me because sometimes I I don't notice when you guys uh, on the screen there have a question. So hang on one second. Sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah. Mother Nature has an exit strategy for all of us, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> It's when the lights go out. Um, but in business, your exit strategy is going to do one or two things. It's going to kill the business or enable the business to thrive after you're gone. And um, for us, our exit strategy was to set up the business and put the business into corporations and over a period of years start giving stock to the employees as bonuses and stuff so that as I got closer to retiring or something happened, or wanted to do something else, the employees could take over and run the business. And our first two corporations are now predominantly employee-owned. I'm more of a figurehead, and you know, I advise technically and stuff like that. Um, the third corporation, we're just starting to look at that. The sole proprietorship, it's not going to happen because it's too dependent on me and my experience. Um, but back to the other question about the end of our business cycle, whatever. At this point, I don't see any end of the, as long as the government lets us fly airplanes, rich people are gonna wanna have really cool toys and bragging rights and stuff like that. And it's like uh, the collector cars and boats and all that stuff. Um, they're toys and there's always people that want the latest and fastest toy and stuff like that. So the question from Baker. So, so what, what was your question? I was kind of roaming your website and I found a comment on there related to your warranty. Mm -hmm. How do you warranty your work? So if I have a an airplane from the 1930s or so and you fix it and then it doesn't work you know after a short time, how do you go about handling those type, types of issues? The warranty <coughs> Um, the incentive to get it right is really high in what we do, and so we, most of the problems that we have turn up when we do the test run because, we, like I said, we run them for three or four hours. We do at least five or six takeoff scenarios, which is where the engines get their most load and have the, the most problems. And when the engine leaves, that's all taken care of. Again, the issue we're dealing with is the stuff that somebody said 70 years old. It's all older than I am. I think it's older than all of us, um, some of us put together. But um, the our warranty is for a year or 50 hours of operation, which may not sound like a lot, but with airplanes like these, um, a P-51 costs about $3,000 an hour to operate, and that's assuming you're doing a 50-year operational budget. So. Um, most of these guys average about 40 or 50 hours a year operation. So basically we warranty everything for the first year. Um, as you all know, um, the owner operator of pretty much anything can do some severe damage to things. And these engines, because they're old and all that, they're very sensitive to being cared for properly and maintaining and all of that stuff. And 
Part of our warranty obligation is they're obligated to maintain and operate the airplane or the engine properly, servicing it, oil changes, inspections, and all that. Um, and if there's a problem, we have two choices. They can pay the cost of us going to the airplane and then doing the repair work for free, or they can pull the engine out, ship it back to us, and we'll do the work for free at the home base and stuff. It just depends on the level and the nature of the, of the problem. But obviously, from a um, customer relations standpoint, it's real important that we don't have problems. And from our reputation and the business standpoint, because warranty work is expensive. I mean, it'll lead up your margin in a hurry. So. Yeah, it's probably understood by the uh, customer that these are not, these are kind of low usage. They're not planes that you would go out and fly just to just whatever. They're kind of for play, as you said earlier. Yeah, yeah, they're not everyday airplanes. Has everybody heard the story about the everyday shoes? A real quick anecdote. So. Oh, okay, right. guy graduates from business college, moves to New York, gets a job with a firm in New York, and gets his first paycheck, goes out to the local shoe store that has a really incredibly beautiful pair of Italian shoes, you know, you know, wingtips, whatever they were back in the 60s, whatever. Beautiful pair of shoes made in Italy. Three, four times what you'd ever pay for a pair of shoes. Gets the shoes, wears them to work every day. About three weeks later, he's having problems with the sole or the heel. Takes it back to the shoe store and he says, Look at this shoe, it's falling apart. And the guy says, What have you done to this? You only bought it three weeks ago. And he says, Well, I wear it to the office every day. And he goes, No, no, these are not everyday shoes. These are weddings, funerals, taking a girl out the first date, and things like that. These are not everyday airplanes. This is not something they're operating every day and stuff. So. <laughs> Did you touch on international uh, or anything like that earlier? I don't think no, we did no. yet. No, go ahead. It was part of that was part of Paulette's question too. I think uh, it'd be interesting yeah. to hear how many of your customers are not in this country, basically. But, but Tom, do you want to expand on what you wanted to ask? Well, yeah, just in I, obviously you're working on uh, Japanese and German aircraft and Russian aircraft, so you're probably dealing with uh, people in other countries. Um, what kind of challenges have you seen in trying to bridge that cultural divide? Of, of, of working with people from other cultures? Um, it's, um, early on it was challenging at first, but surprisingly, because of the way the stuff goes back and forth internationally, the planes are always being bought and sold back and forth. We've got a number of German customers that are sending their engines over to us to be done. Um, we've got Americans that are having their airplanes done in Germany and England and bringing them back. So there's a huge network of work going back and forth. Um, the, we're just starting to get involved with the Japanese right now. Um, so, but fortunately I had a Japanese mechanic we hired eight years ago, and so he's gonna really be helpful with that here. Um, the Germans, uh, surprisingly enough, um, English is the international language. Everywhere we've gone, especially with airplane people, there's no problem with speaking English, communicating. Um, documents are all in English, things like that. So we really don't have a problem with that. Um, some of the, cu the customers handle all the customs, import duties, things like that. Um, so that's really not an issue. Um, but we are very international. Um, I'd say at least 25% of our sales are overseas, international sales. and. Um, which from an economic standpoint has been a real blessing because, you know, as the economy's up and down around the world and in the United States and stuff, um, as one factor of the economy has a bad season, they sell their toys off, well, they go to the guys that are having a good season, the people that are having, you know, an oil refining dropped off before the oil shortage back in the 70s, you know, the oil guys were buying a ton of airplanes. And then a few years ago, they were buying them again and then now they're selling them again. So the, the airplanes are constantly moving around. It's just, uh, it's like art. It's like it's real high-end artwork and stuff. The millionaires are constantly moving that stuff around. And um, it's a, for them, it's a great investment. And most of them, uh, Jay Leno said, man, what other kind of art can you drive or play with? You know, the rest
rest of it, you keep it locked up and nobody gets to touch it. So this stuff, you get to go out and play with it. So I, I, that leads to another question. Uh, do most of your customers see their their what you're doing for them as an investment that's appreciating? As yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time the stock market takes a hit, this stuff goes up. When um, the market crashed, what was the last crash we had? 87, what was it? Somewhere around that. Yeah, that was a huge crash, 87, 88, when the market crashed. Uh, collector cars, collector airplanes, over the next two years went up almost 30, 40% in value. So, it's, um, you know, it's that movie Wall Street, the second one, money never stops. It's true, money's always moving somewhere. The worst thing you can do is let your money sit somewhere. Go ahead. Well, they'll continue to go up in value. You know, as time goes on, there's less of them. You know, I mean, God, God willing, you know, they, they crash and you know things happen. Just like cars, same thing. You know, there's less of them. Mm -hmm. More scarcity increases the value. Yep. Yeah. There's that issue, and unfortunately, some of the pilots we worked with were not pretty. You know, they weren't very smart. They um, uh, one of the legendary. Legends in Aviation is Bob Brewer. He was a North American test pilot. He fought in World War II in Europe and all that, and used to give an amazing display in aerobatic ability for North American Rockwell. And um, he had a great saying. He said, hey, if you want to kill yourself, that's fine, but don't ruin a perfectly good airplane and probably a good friend. Because a lot of times they take somebody with them. And, stuff. And, and that sadly is you know, the dark side of what we do is Every once in a while, somebody will make a fatal mistake. They'll turn a minor problem in and deny it, and then the next thing they know, it's not recoverable and stuff. But on the other hand, the value of these airplanes has generated a lot of, um, a lot more parts are being made now. Airplanes that we would never look at restoring are now, uh, you know, being restored. And um, the f it's interesting as we've gotten into different engines that we've brought online that we could restore. Um, take the German engines. We did our first Messerschmitt engine um, in the late 90s. It flew the first time in the fall of 99. Um, in the last 16, 17 years, the German restoration market has gone off the clock because now they know they can get the engines to run. So and without the engines, you don't have an airplane. You just have a, a shiny trinket in the hangar somewhere. And because of that, uh, well, in fact, one of the shops in Germany um, that we do engines for, um, we go over there probably once a year, work with them and stuff. And, you know, he sent me an email a while back, because we just finished a new product, new engine that they hadn't done before. And he said, we live and die by you. He said, if, if you quit putting engines out, we're dead. We can't get the airplanes restored because they can't, you know, they have to have the engines. And, well, that, you know, and, and that's the, the you know, the responsibility side. But the good side is because of what we're doing over here, uh, there's dozens of people working in Europe because they can get the engines so the airplanes are being restored and things like that. So, so, how, so how do you decide uh, whether or not to, to tackle a new engine, uh, a new type of engine? For me, that's like going into a candy store or a Snap-on to Ultra. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, if somebody comes up and says, hey, I'd like to get this project done, um, anything in World War II would take on now. We have... It's a passion. Yeah, it's a passion. Yeah, I love what I'm doing, and I get paid to do it. And um, it's... You know, the sad thing about business is most of the jobs we get and work at, I mean, they're okay. I mean, we like... We're good at it. We do whatever and all that stuff. But... Um, it's rare that you can be doing something that you absolutely love that you would almost do for free. So for you, choosing to do an engine is less of a business decision and more of a personal interest? Oh, it's a challenge. It's a personal challenge. Yeah, I, it, that's the downside of my business work ethic is the challenge is more important to me than being successful financially. And that's why I have people around me that figure out how to make money doing it and do the <laughs> billing and all that stuff. Because otherwise, it'd be a charitable organization. It'd be a nonprofit. My wife works for a nonprofit. I have to work for. A, well, everybody saw the original Ghostbuster movie, right? Is there anybody here who hasn't seen the original Ghostbuster movie? 
There's a great scene where they've been kicked out of their workshop. They're sitting on the steps of the library in New York, mm -hmm. and the one guy says, what, you know, what are we going to do? And the one guy says, well, we could get a job. And the other guy goes, ah, no, no, I've done the private sector. They expect results. You know, they expect to make a profit, you know, meet their margins and stuff like that. So, you know, and, and that's a challenge with business because it's passion that gets us into small business. It's passion that gets us to open their own business or take the next step to try to do a new product or something like that. And then we have to balance it with the business. With black and white numbers. And sadly, they don't lie. And sometimes accountants can make them lie, but you know, normally numbers don't lie. So. What else? Next Bakersfield, I, I, like, it's been a while since I looked up and saw whether anybody there wanted to chime in with another question. Don't, don't everybody speak at once. We've got plenty on the computer. Can you hear me, Dr.? Yeah, go ahead, Haled. Uh, part of my question about the uh, international uh, market, because uh, every business has to have a sustain uh, sustainability plan. So basically, how many, how many planes that you gonna pay, are available to be fixed in the U.S.? So do you, do you think maybe in the future there's going to be no plane to fix or, uh, or at least going to be minor stuff to do? That's why I was asking if he's looking to target the international market. It means he's going to the international market, not waiting for the other companies to come to him. Uh, like not companies, uh, I mean uh, the owners of the flights to come uh -huh. to him. Did you? Okay. Yeah, I understand where you're going with that. The um, because we're the largest facility in the world now and we can do pretty much anything to do with these airplanes, um, we're the number one resource to get World War II airplanes done. And there's really nothing overseas that's, um, there's no other international company that's doing what we're doing. And again, what I said at the beginning of the talk, in America, we're, we can set up businesses so easily, and we can grow, we can expand, and all of that stuff. Um, to do what we do overseas is almost impossible now because there's no parts available. Most of the parts for these engines are in the United States. Um, we have a number of the engines that were built in World War II, we're the only source of parts for it. And so the competitors just don't have a, they really don't have a chance at this stage. Um, the few have tried, even in the United States in the last few years, just are not successful because they have to make so many parts to even begin to put out a product. The one group back east that tried to compete with us about 10 years ago, their price point is 50 to 75 percent higher than ours is for the same product. And um, it's tough for them. Yeah, we had a good conversation a while back. And, he was talking about the next part he wants to make, and I laughed and I said, you're never going to make any money at this. And uh, even Warren Buffett says, when it comes to aviation, the, the industry as a whole yet has to make a net profit because of the constant inflow of capital and development and all the other stuff. But for us, uh, as far as the, the market that we're working with, there are a limited number of airplanes. We lose airplanes with crashes. We gain airplanes with new restorations, so the net number is increasing steadily. Uh, two, three, four percent a year, the volume of airplanes is increasing. The advantage that we have is all the airplane engines have a life cycle of, oh, some of the German engines are 200 hours of operation, the American engines, like in a Mustang, is 500 hours. So most of the engines have a uh, five to 10 year service life, then they have to be redone. In fact, in England, in fact, in the European market, they've now gone back and made it a mandatory 10 years. At 10 years, whether you've got two hours on it or a thousand hours, it has to be rebuilt. So. So there is a cost control of this design? Yes. As long as they fly them, we're gonna be working. I, I think okay. that, uh, Hala, did you wanna, were, were you, uh, ask another question or not? Oh, just, uh, just a curious question. When people, because all these like, uh, army uh, planes, basically, army planes, if they, if they, is there any issues to get like uh, this kind of uh, planes from international to get to get? Is there any, uh, is there, not in the documentation, it's uh, outside of, is there any uh, permits to, uh, 
to export when the problem is done. Did you get the question? Yeah, the, the only airplanes that can't be imported back and forth now are airplanes that were built after the mid-60s. Um, historically, what happened in the mid-60s up at San Jose Airport, um, an amateur pilot tried to take off with a Korean War era jet and um, picked the nose up too high too fast and the airplane didn't actually lift off went through the fence, crossed the highway, and hit an ice cream parlor and killed a couple dozen kids and adults. And it was a real disaster for aviation. And the military came in and uh, Congress and all that, and they said, okay, no more uh, military airplanes are gonna be sold to civilians from this date forward. They grandfathered in the ones that were already out there and stuff like that, but, um, so basically everything we're dealing with is grandfathered in for going back and forth internationally. Um, the, the FAA has to um, inspect and approve the airplane before it gets flown in the United States. The Europeans have their own CAA um, equivalent that goes through all the paperwork and makes sure that everything flies. Um, and different governments have different standards for the paperwork. Um, Australia is probably the worst. In fact, Australia is so bad with these airplanes, the saying in the industry is the airplane can't fly until the paperwork equals or exceeds the weight of the airplane. <laughs> so. And we all know what an elephant is. It's a mouse built to government specification. <laughs> uh, I think actually a good segue off of, uh, of Paulette's question uh, is a second half of MG's question, who's sitting right next to him there in Bakersfield. MG had uh, written up before, how many projects can you run or will you run simultaneously? And I, I imagine, like, you know, people were initially asking, is there enough market for you with, with planes getting older and older? But I think it's actually the reverse question. Like, do you have a capacity problem being able to, like, there's only yeah. so many people working at your place and there's only so many engines you can restore in parallel. Um, with uh, American engines and stuff like that, we have a start date every three weeks to start an engine. We currently have uh, 10 or 12 engines in process at V12s, spinning V12s. Um, at radials, I have less manpower. Uh, we currently have five engines in process, including a couple German engines. So um, right now, I would say there's probably 18 engines in process. Yeah, 16 to 18 engines, various stages of progress right now. So is the demand so much that you're only filling demand? Do you, or, or is there a point where you can, we're gonna make this engine because we know it will sell? We haven't done a spec, uh, speculative engine in 15 years. We can't fly before. And we've, with the German engines, we got a four or five year waiting list. Uh, with the radial engines, we've got now probably six months before we can take something in. V12s, it's just it's booked up three or four years out and stuff. So, I mean, it's an incredible place to be in business. Um, so, is there is there value in in trying to increase your operations so that you can shorten those lead times, or is that is that are those kind of people they're willing to wait the four or five years? and you're not worried about losing that business? They, you know, with the German stuff, the, it's typically three or four years to get the airplane restored. And I tell them the sooner we start on it, the, lo the more likelihood it'll be done when the airplane needs it. Um, the, uh, a typical P-51 airplane engine, a Mustang, um, we can do one of those engines in less than 90 days. So, um, and a lot of times customers are having an engine done as a spare, they'll allow, somebody else to buy their spare and then take the next slot and stuff like that. But the exotic engines, um, I, I tell the customer, they say, hey look, it's gonna cost twice as much and take twice as long as you can imagine in your worst day. And treat us as starving artists, send us money every month and come by once in a while. And at the end of the day, it'll be done. And um, you know, cause a lot of times we're having special parts made and you know, we have to have samples made and we have to check them and then, you know we're having a special rubber seal made for one of the German engines we're doing. Uh, we're the, the, the vendors on the second molding process 
um, because they didn't take any account for expansion and it didn't work. Um, things like that. Um, other stuff, you know the old saying, it takes nine months to make a baby and all that. If you have nine women, you're still going to take nine months to make a baby. <laughs> it, it, there's just certain things that have to be done sequentially. You know, where we can do parallel, we'll do parallel. But, you know, a lot of times it isn't going to happen. You know, there's just no way to speed the process up. And technicians, the talent that we need to do what we do is becoming a real problem because the education system in the United States back in the 50s, you know, we made this mindset that white collar, college educated jobs is the future. Blue collar, tradesmen, technician guys, people, we're not going to need them when everything's, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's and a very interesting parallel to the problem that I, I have a good friend who's the general manager of Animal Valley Ford, mm -hmm. and, and he has the exact same problem. He has seven open slots for technicians that would make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year, and he can't fill them. Oh, absolutely. Uh, a lot of my guys make 50000 a year. And, um, I mean, my lowest paid guy makes thirty, and all he does is clean parts. But, um, and, and that's the challenge we've got. We have to have our own in-house training system. We've got textbooks that we've got, and on-the-job training sessions periodically. And when I went to school, high school in the 60s, early 60s, we had shop classes. You could learn to be metal benders. You could do auto shop, electrical stuff, um, all the basic skills. And I mean, you had business machines, typing. I mean, all this stuff was available in high school. And now, you know, we're not turning out kids that can do any technical stuff. In fact, one of our good friends is Jack Roush with NASCAR. And he's got a huge operation between the NASCAR racing um, he's drag racing, um, he does high performance modifications for the Ford Mustangs and things like that. I mean, he's in a lot of different stuff. He's got like 3,000 employees. And um, I was talking to him the other day because one of my, we always have a, a, a high school kid that works after school a few hours and he graduates next week. And he was asking if I, there was any chance of getting into a NASCAR job. And I just bounced it off of Jack, just as a conversation. And he said, basically, they, they only hire two kinds of people. They hire engineers that are right out of college with an engineering degree to, to work in their engineering or business aspects, um, white collar. Or he said, when it comes to the guys in the field that are working on the cars and the teams and all that, he said, if they haven't been doing this since they're 12, 14, he says, we're not interested. He said, they don't have the passion. And he said, the worst thing we're dealing with is the kids who go to the trade schools and get the certificate that says they know how to work on cars and all that stuff. And he said, most of these trade schools charge way too much because student loans are subsidized. And the earlier conversation we'll get on, um, they overpromise and underserve. And so they're putting kids out there that think they've got a talent that they can market and they just don't have a lot of ex real world experience. That was, that was his comment in my interview of him for a previous class is that uh, uh, the, the kids coming out of, uh, what was it, UI, uh, UTI, yeah. uh, they, they come out with an attitude or a chip on their shoulder that they're worth, you know, so much money, uh, even though they have got no experience, and that uh, uh, it's good to have some sort of education or training, but really you're learning in the shop as you do the jobs day in and day out. Oh, it's amazing how many kids out there today, young people, have never heard of the term righty tighty lefty loosey. You know, when you're using a screwdriver, and the terminology and utilization of this stuff is, uh, and I understand it. I mean, how many of you guys can change the battery on your cell phone? I mean, it's you know, you got to get the special little tiny screwdrivers and all the other stuff. But um, it's sealed. <laughs> the yeah, the Skype conversation you had with what was his name? Garrett. Garrett. Um, you know, one of the things that really impressed me that came up in the conversation was the value of different college degrees and educations and diplomas and the marketing value and all of that stuff. And, you know, your grade scores and stuff like that. And um, the amount of debt that people are coming out of universities now with um, and the marketability they have for their skill set, it's way out of proportion. In fact, I was talking to our local banker just the other day, 
about that issue. And he said, if those loans weren't federally subsidized, we wouldn't even open the door. He said they are so high risk and so unsupported statistically for easily two thirds of the high end degrees and stuff. And um, you know, some of the really successful people that I've worked with over the years, you know, they say when you go in and ask for a, a job, you know, they want to know what you know and they want to know what skill set you want to have, what experience you have. They want to know your attitude, your work ethic and stuff like that. Has anybody here gone to a job interview and they asked to see your transcript and your grade point average and all that? Only if you no. never applied for the government. <laughs> that doesn't count. That's not the real world. Um, yeah, I mean, really. I mean, it's, uh, you go to the bank, they don't ask to see your grade point average. You know, when you want, when you want to expand your business and you go to the bank and you say, I've got a degree from Harvard in business, you know, minor in law, corporate law, and all that stuff, and I want to borrow a million dollars to expand my business and all that stuff. The first thing they want to see is your tax returns. They want to see your track record. They want to see what you've been successful at and how you're doing it. And it's, you know, are you getting better at it or are you getting worse at it and stuff like that. And is this loan viable because you're going to be a successful expanding? Or are you just looking for money as a Hail Mary to bail you out from some stupid mistake you made because you didn't listen to your partner or your wife or somebody else? So that's, you know, one of the areas and stuff. Mike, you want I, one I'm, more? I, I'm, 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 this is, this is so much valuable that more valuable than what else I could be doing with this time right now. I know you probably have other things to do. It's 1130. I just want to make sure yeah. that. Why don't we do one more question and then I'll wish you all luck and life. Um, I don't want to end with this one, but it's one of the only ones, like, I'm going to, can I do one yeah. and a half? Yeah. Oh, so nice. Valerie actually asked. Hey, if my wife starts giving None of those. I, 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 I want to know the answer, too. Yeah. Any relation to Richard? <laughs> Richard who? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's way back If you go back to Ireland and England, um, back in the 15, 1600s, yeah. But, no, I actually met him and his brother Tom back in the 50s when we lived down in LA, and my dad being a businessman and all that, my dad actually did some work for the Nixon family um, when they had some restaurants and stores down the Whittier area and stuff, and his brother was a great guy, and Richard had potential, but again, remember what I said earlier on about not having trusted advisors that have the authority <laughs> and the empowerment to say no, get your head out of that dark place, that's what killed him. He quit listening to people advising him. So you want, you want people advising you that um, can tell you no and say wait up, back up, and you want people that have integrity. You, um, you know, there's, there's tax accountants that you go into and you give them all your paperwork and stuff and the first question they ask is how much do you want to pay in taxes? They don't want to ask how much, you know, they want to go through and see what you've done legally or whatever and stuff like that. The first thing they want to know is how much do you want what percentage of playing with the numbers do you want them to do risk factor? Because the more they play, the higher the risk you're going to get it audited and stuff. So you've got a situation where, well, we just want to do what's right, you know. Find out what it is and figure out how to pay it and stuff. So you want advisors that are, have a lot of integrity and a little bit of a track record. So. Who wants to jump in with the last question? Bakersfield, do you guys want to, do you have anything that you haven't asked yet? Okay. So, as you said, I think you, you said it earlier, but so you think staffing is going to be one of your biggest problems coming in the future? Because, like, as Tom went into with, like, boards and stuff like that, a lot of the new guys come in, and it's a, it's a big difference in the new motors and the old motors is, like, you know, nowadays you plug a computer into it and it says, oh, you know, this is your problem, replace this part, whereas in the old motors, you had to know something about something to figure out what was wrong with the motor. You know, you had to actually have experience and knowledge to figure out, oh, it's not getting gas or it's not getting this or whatever it is. Is that one of your biggest issues you have now is keeping guys that are that actually have, or getting guys that actually have practical knowledge with the aircraft engine? You know, it's interesting. The, uh, a good way to answer that is most of the people that come to work for us last a week or two or they stay. I have very low turnover. Um, the... 
you know, the first few weeks we all know whether they're going to make it or not. Some of them take two or three months before we really get a feel for them. But um, most of the people that are doing this really want to work with their hands and stuff. And, and, and we have uh, tiers, you know, we have levels of skill sets. And as they get to where, um, you know, they first start tearing stuff down, then they learn to clean and paint, and then they start doing smaller sub-assemblies. And as they get to the point where they're doing some of the major build-up work, then I start transitioning them into troubleshooting, especially when we're doing the test running. Uh, we started a German engine yesterday afternoon. We tried to start it. We had a couple pops out of it, then it wouldn't start, it wouldn't run. And um, they had a couple hoses hooked up wrong. And so I had to walk through the, the systems with the two guys I was working with and get them to understand that there's two fuel flow systems, pumps and all that stuff. One's basically for priming and starting, and the other one's for running. And why, you know, it wouldn't work backwards. And, um, and it's part of the on-the-job training and the manualing. And just, um, again, it's in-house training. And as long as people want to work and have some talent, we'll, we'll always be able to be able to do something with them. And more and more, um, we're seeing kids coming out of high school that know they don't want to go to college. They want to do stuff. And um, so I, I just, you know, it's kind of in our nature. You know, we like to do things. We want to use our, not only just our mind, but we want to use our hands. We want to use um, all of our package that we're blessed with. We don't want to just sit there punching a keyboard and stuff. We want to, we want to see results. That's what I'm saying. And that's where the troubleshooting and the training all come out. And for my guys at work, it's great. I mean, you work on something for months, months, a year, on and off, and then the day we take it out and actually run it, I mean, that's a big deal for the guys to see their work actually make noise. And we can turn 60, 70 gallons of high-octane ab gas into noise uh, in an hour <laughs> at $5 a gallon. That's pretty, it's, it's, I mean, watching that fuel level go down is just, yeah, and get another couple drums of gas and stuff. But, but again, like I said, as my wife pointed, it's passion. I mean, I, we we love what we do, and you know, the last thing you want to do is get in a situation where you're just counting the hours and days and, and all that stuff. Well, one of the one of the things that they teach us through many of the different classes is that uh, job satisfaction. A lot of it comes from being able to see or relate to the end product and what you're actually producing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that I think that. What you're saying there really is is true. Yeah, I, I don't know what year he was president, but back in the early 1900s, Calvin Coolidge said, "The business of America is business." And when you look at the product and services that the United States provides, it's just incredible. And I mean, we're the cutting edge. I mean, yeah, they can figure out how to make it cheaper and smaller overseas, but so much of their knowledge has come from our our schools, our education system. Or they just steal it, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, Mike, I'm this, good. You're this good. has Thank been a, you. like I, I have like I was I was telling your wife a little bit while uh, when you guys first got here. Um, you know, I got to I got to Kern County two years ago, and um, yeah, I, my my path through life was you know big big chunk in the music business uh, was. Uh, uh, little bit of, uh, of, of consulting and some high-tech startup work with my dad but I've never really been around aviation and as a as a as a giddy kid I loved this stuff and this is the first time I've actually been able to get somebody from this the aviation community here to come in and speak so I think everybody here got a lot out of this but I, I want to tell you personally that I've it's been. It, I, I felt like a twelve-year-old kid sitting here oh, listening good. to like how the how this stuff works. I really appreciate you coming. Okay. Yeah. If we want to do something in the fall, I've got a great seven or eight-minute video that gives a uh, just an overview of the restoration process of the airplanes and the engines. And I I will take but, you up on um, that. That'd be awesome. The, uh, the in closing, the only thing I want to say is that when you leave this university, college, you know, education system, and go out into the work world. You're going to leave with two things. You're going to leave with a lot of tools, like accounting principles and uh, things like that. And you're going to leave with a lot of theories. And it's your job to figure out how to make them work. And it's your mm -hmm. job to figure out what what's what 
you can turn from theoretical knowledge into practical knowledge and turn it into tools that you can use. Because an awful lot of stuff that, um, I mean, look how many business books are published every week and stuff. And some of them I can't even get through the first chapter. It's just like, oh, yeah, this guy has not that clue. And um, it's, uh, and some of them, man, they, they grab you and you can't put the book down. And, and again, never stop learning. You know, whether it's an ebook reader or hard copy or whatever, constantly have books that you're going to read and stuff you're going to study and things like that. So, hey, great to meet you guys. Let's give Mike a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck in your ventures and all that. Yeah.